Hi, I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot. I'm here to talk about my latest interview with Captain Mark Richards of the Secret Space Program. And uh, I was just visiting him a couple of weeks ago with his wife, Joanne Richards, who is uh, actually out on the circuit talking about his information. And I visit him uh, actually about twice a year is how it works out. And um, it's a fascinating time to spend with Mark and to listen to his answers to my questions and whatever news he has uh, to provide. And he has been in Vacaville prison now for uh, over 30 years. He is what we call a political prisoner, but in reality, uh, he is a political prisoner of the, what is in essence, the Fourth Reich. And for more information on that, you can certainly read the books of Joseph Farrell and Jim Mars, as well as, uh, you know, do your own investigation. So I do want to say that uh, Project Camelot is an investigation. Uh, we are looking to reveal the truth wherever we can find it. And I do want to say use your own discretion. I encourage you to do further research after listening to what I have to say. Um, you don't need to take anything on board as truth verbatim. I interview people because I am looking for what are in essence nuggets of truth. I don't believe any one person has the whole truth. And uh, certainly this information is going to be highly contentious. So I do encourage you to do your own research and come to your own conclusions. So with that said, I, I want to say that uh, when I interview Mark, I do find a great deal of truth in his testimony. And uh, most of it in my estimation, putting together uh, three or more uh, witnesses who do not know each other and are saying the same thing is a beginning to really finding out what's really true. And in Mark's case, most of everything he has ever told me has either come to pass or checked out. Uh, now there are things that we have no way of checking at this time. I have other corroborating testimony uh, across the Camelot uh, information and I have been now doing this for 11 years. So um, I've got over, let's see, uh, nearly 600 video interviews and uh, I have radio shows as well, interviews with people around the world, including whistleblowers from Above Top Secret, which is how we started out and our specialty, so to speak. So um, in, in these interviews, uh, I am not allowed to do any recordings. I have no, um, I can't, can't film it, can't bring in a camera, uh, and I'm only normally only allowed a, a small pencil. In this case, I had uh, a security guard who actually gave me a pen, and that allowed me to take much better notes than usual. I will say that this session was shorter than usual, uh, normally I have around four hours with him. This is my sixth interview with him. So I've got five other interview total, what I call total recall, which is basically my memory of everything that was said uh, with the help of, of notes that I take during the interview. And um, what I'm doing here is, is communicating with you, the audience, to share what we talk about uh, and, and what he has to say. So to the best of my ability, this is, is actually what I, I take away from those meetings. So uh, I also want to say that um, when I first met with Mark this time, we talked about prison business, as I call it, basically talking about what's going on with Mark, what's going on with the prison, uh, the fact that there have been two prison deaths right before I arrived uh, and that they were possibly, he feels, uh, to do with some moves that are going to happen. They may have been suicides uh, or, or happened in another way. I don't know the whole details about those deaths. I can tell you that Mark is being moved to a lower security uh, facility that's still on the same Vacaville uh, site. Uh, in the near future, and he said that uh, he and several older men will be moved over there. They are concerned because, one, they'll be moving in with prisoners that are 
what they consider are, are actually temporary prisoners, and they're all, often younger men, uh, and so they, they fear for their safety in, in some cases. And also, uh, the whole thing is being motivated by a move to get the, uh, the prisons to empty out, and this is coming from the Republican administration. There is pressure for the prisons to give, actually, parole to the prisoners, and for some reason they are very um, reticent to do that, and for some reason they are um, trying to hide the fact that they're overcrowded, uh, although it is well known, uh, and they are doing things that are rather nefarious, one of those things being to transport prison prisoners out of state so they don't show up on the California uh, roll, rolls, I guess. And then I guess at some point they'd be moved out back, but I, I don't know the details on that either. Um, so we did talk about that briefly. Uh, and the men are very concerned, the ones moving into the low security area, because they won't be able to bring their typewriters and other uh, personal belongings and so on that they've accrued over the years. So this is a, a matter of great concern to them. At this point, I'll get into the actual uh, details of what we talked about. In the beginning, we talked about Jack Sarfati. Jack Sarfati is a physicist, quite well known. He has a website called stardrive.org, I believe it is, and uh, you can look him up on the internet to get more details about Jack. I had seen him the night before in San Francisco, where we stay overnight prior to doing the early morning interview with, with Mark Richards. And um, we were able to visit with Jack. Uh, I'm hoping to do an interview in the near future with him. He has agreed, uh, and it is dependent on us being in the same city uh, at the same time. He goes between England and the U.S. as I do at this time. He has a, a, a partner in England. So um, we're going to try to arrange that in the near future, either here, possibly in Los Angeles or up in San Francisco, or as I say, uh, in England. So uh, it was interesting talking to Mark about Jack Sarfati. I can tell you that Jack, when I brought up Mark's name, uh, was familiar with Mark Richards and apparently his story. He did refer to Mark. Uh, he voluntarily said that he felt that Mark was a political prisoner, and which indeed he is. And uh, I also told him about the neutron star energy, which Mark says is the most advanced technology that we have. And this is to use to power spacecraft when they go interdimensional. And uh, what Jack's question to Mark was, uh, then how do the spacecraft get in the vicinity of the neutron star to begin with. And what Mark said is that they can use almost any technology to get out to a certain place in space where they then jump uh, to the vicinity of the neutron star, you know, bending space time, in essence, going through what he calls a dimensional slide or gateway. And then once they're in the vicinity of the neutron star, they uh, are accessing the energy by way of something he called ram scooping or sucking up the neutrons. So that's, that was his answer. Uh, another thing he said about the neutron stars is that they can be used as weapons, that there is a means using gravity, which he says that our space program and humans are not completely familiar with and un they don't fully understand gravity at this time here on planet Earth, but he said they can use gravity flux to push a neutron star into a wormhole and that it then would go out the other end and if shot through a wormhole, he said it, it can be an, an incredibly effective weapon. In addition, Mark mentioned that he did know Jack Sarfati, that he had met him in the past he wouldn't say where or how. Uh, he did say that he has a family member that is involved somehow with, uh, with some family member associated with Jack Sarfati. So um, I can say that uh, 
It's, it's, it's quite interesting that the two do know each other. One thing that Mark Richards wanted me to convey to Jack is that he feels that he is not fully read in at this time, that it's important that he try to find out more about what's really going on. He did think that Jack Sarfati would be a great person to demonstrate some of the technology that Mark has talked about um, and to, to um, share, share that with the public. So that was a very interesting thing. He, and he did tell me that I could communicate with Sarfati as to uh, some of the things he's saying here, and which I will do. Uh, now, Mark also talked about Trump, and he said that he is positive that Trump is not fully read in. Uh, he can't say how he knows that. He did say that he doesn't feel that Trump has enough good people around him, is how he put it. He says... Uh, that he is being fed some bad info, as he put it. He also um, says that Republicans uh, are afraid of him because he is something of a loose cannon and could be, do anything at any time. So that was his take on Trump. I then asked him about uh, what he thought about Putin because I've had um, many people on the alternative sector often refer to Putin as being somebody who is, in theory, um, in contact with some Nordic beings, supposedly working uh, in a positive way on the planet at this time. And Mark felt that, uh, that Putin is not a good guy. He felt that Putin would not even classify himself as such. Putin is motivated to work on behalf of Russia and himself and that he is not out to help humanity in Mark's view. He says he is being manipulated by the reptoids. He said that Putin is not a reptilian, however, and he also wanted to say in all fairness that both the US and Russia are being uh, manipulated to, to try to keep them apart and also to try to keep them from uh, going into space so that there are there are sabotage that is happening basically uh, by the reptoids to as um, this actually gets back to William Tompkins information and seems to be um, corroborating that basically saying that our space programs are being um, sabotaged at times uh, in order to keep us out of space and um, Mark also said uh, that Trump, in terms of the Russia-Trump association, that Trump's attitude towards Russia is more of that of a businessman. He says it stems from the 1990s when, uh, when uh, Trump was uh, dealing with Russia uh, as a businessman and he was interested in keeping things friendly and uh, in order to, to make and facilitate business. So um, there is a, uh, as I say, a big push to keep uh, us out of space and to keep Russia from, and the U.S. from, from getting along, in essence. Uh, another thing we talked about is that he watches Meet the Press every Sunday. He says the show makes him angry. Um, one of the reasons is the host. He feels he's quite obnoxious and... I guess, in essence, trying to get people off track um, instead of reveal the truth. And uh, so that was kind of an interesting aside. We talked about this new solar system. I believe it's called TRAPPIST-1. It's uh, announced by NASA. And Mark said that it was announced in violation of a treaty that Earth signed um, with those planets that are part of the Trappist-1 uh, solar system, if I understand this correctly. He said it was 40 million light years away, that it has nine planets uh, circulating around a red dwarf. Uh, from what I understand, there are three planets with life forms on there. Um, and he said that we were not supposed to reveal the whereabouts of that solar system and that we have now aggravated those particular beings he said by breaking that treaty, he would not tell me uh, what the beings were like. Uh, he would not describe them for some reason. 
He said that they, those beings do not consider us enemies, but instead um, actually sort of consider us neither friends nor enemies, that they relate to Earth similar to the way India relates to the U.S. And um, so that was his analogy. Uh, and I asked him when he talks about how a, a, another planetary system would relate to the Earth, and when they say, you know, Earth, are they talking about, you know, humanity in general or, or what? And he said that they are actually talking about humans, uh, the secret space program, the United Nations, uh, governments and our allies, which has to do with uh, the raptors, the Nordics, various Nordic races we are uh, working with as well as the reptoids and uh, the ant beings. So he said that we are viewed as, as sort of a, a conglomeration of these elements when uh, other, other races are dealing with us from our planet. So that's very interesting. Um, Antarctica, we talked about Antarctica. He is aware of, of what's going on with Antarctica and uh, John Kerry's visit, Buzz Aldrin's visit. Um, he did say that he believed that it's very possible that some of the rumors about uh, Antarctica and Atlantis may be true in terms of that Atlantis could in fact uh, be, um, Antarctica could be a piece of Atlantis. Um, he says, though that many people when dealing with Antarctica and viewing it are seeing really in reality into another dimension. It could be Earth 2 or 3 or 4 is how he put it. Um, he said there are tons of remnants that are left behind uh, I guess throughout history on Antarctica. He uh, he talked about the, this mountainside that is a uh, basically a portal into uh, Antarctica and into these other dimensions. He said that John Kerry has dealt with a lot of information over the years and that he uses his his information as leverage to get him access to certain things and, and places and uh, things that he, he would like to have access to. So he also talked about uh, we talked about the possibility that there may be some new races showing up in Antarctica and he wouldn't answer that question but he said he would give an example of where a new race might be showing up what they might be like if there was such a race he said for example there could be these energy beings that are uh, friendly towards us but that are also without knowing it, detrimental to us because they may spit acid that then dissolves human skin. So uh, he said, you know, there are issues at, of that nature going on uh, when we're dealing with other races. And he also said uh, that Antarctica has become a kind of a preferred meeting place for meeting with other races partially because of the surveillance, the pervasive surveillance around the globe at this time. And my interpretation of that is that he's not just talking about human surveillance. He's also talking about artificial intelligence, um, not only ours, but that the artificial intelligence belonging to various ET races. So, for example, if our government wanted to re sort of um, if our government wanted to meet with a certain ET race in private uh, and not let other ET races there meeting with them, then Antarctica has become a select meeting place in that regard. Um, so that that's how I would interpret that. And uh, we then talked about Atlanta. He said that there was in the news and this was reported in the news that there was a piece of freeway that had caught fire that um, I guess fell down or dissolved and that a homeless man was being uh, blamed for this and that in reality this is a uh, what he called a chemical weapon 
or a, a biotech weapon that uh, basically the government was using to experiment with. Uh, he said it's along the lines, if I understood correctly, of what he called Agent Yellow or Agent Red, like Agent Orange. It could be a biohazardous material or bioweapon gone wrong. And or you could see it as a chemical warfare agent. So um, then we talked about Vietnam. I had over the couple years I've been interviewing Mark, I noticed that he referred often to Vietnam as being a place where the war in Vietnam was not really what we thought it was that there was an ET race that we were having dealings with there and that was the main reason for the war in Vietnam. And so we talked about um, what is in essence an invasion that happened and that Vietnam was not about uh, so-called the spread of communism. That it was actually about an invading race of spider beings who uh, originally came to our planet in uh, Angkor Wat, and Angkor Wat is a, an area of Cambodia um, that has these really amazing temples and structures. Those are still standing, but the humans that were part of that civilization, of which there were apparently over a million, uh, disappeared virtually overnight, and there was no trace of them, and it's always been a mystery, and he said that what happened was these spider beings that are the size of what he says are VW bugs, um, those cars, it, uh, basically invaded through the stargates because there's a very, he said, a vast system of stargates and portals in the area of Southeast Asia. And he said they what they first did with the humans there is to mind control them into thinking they were out of water when in reality they had a river that flows through the area. And then once they were weakened by that mind control um, and lack of water, they then came in and decimated them using a, a microwave weapon. And uh, after that, they basically ate, I guess, ate them. And so he says that uh, this, this is what he was telling me, um, and that basically they there is no trace of the humans and no trace of, of anything at this point um, that shows what really happened there. So he said that race of beings is called the Trogs. And he has mentioned these this race in the past uh, on a few other occasions. Although I think this time he was specific as to the fact that they are in essence spider beings. Um, he said at the time they did decimate that race of humans uh, in, uh, if I understood correctly, two and a half days. So that's how long it took them. And uh, then he said they returned through the Stargates. Um, he said during World War II, uh, they returned through the Stargates at the time when our planet and the governments and military were focused on a different part of the world and that basically Vietnam was the resurgence of them coming back through the Stargates. That's what the war was all about. He said that they were successful at that time in repelling them, and uh, apparently they have once again started to come back through. Uh, I'm not sure where, and uh, my understanding they're somehow a threat. He says there are four threatening um, sort of negatively oriented races at this time, uh, threatening invasion of planet Earth. Uh, he said uh, that the soldiers in Vietnam, in most cases, had their minds wiped. They're dealing with PTSD, but they're also dealing with memories that uh, I guess they're trying to bring forward that basically they can't access. Actually, he, he what he has said about Vietnam does coincide with what's going on in the Middle East as well. In that case, it's it's what's called the reptoids and invasion there, and also uh, apparently the return of the Anunnaki, if I understand it correctly, and that the battles going on there have a lot more to do with the, our relationship with all planet races than they do with humans. And um, 
that most or many wars on planet Earth have a an ET uh, element to them, and that that's uh, in many cases it seems the real reason for these wars. We are in essence fighting the battles uh, for the ETs that are are related to us, uh, and they are also coming in uh, and and participating in these wars in space and here on Earth. We talked about a, a book called Phenomena by Annie Jacobson, who is a journalist who has been in the mainstream doing interviews and covering the topics that I cover in Project Camelot. Uh, I was told by Jack Sarfati, for example, that she is given access, but it is uh, not above top secret, and that she is someone that they like because she does not try to push the envelope or go outside the lines that they have drawn and the limitations that they require. So um, that's quite interesting. Mark was aware of her book, Phenomena, which is making the rounds at this time because it talks about the origin and the history of remote viewing as well as what in essence is SciTech, called SciTech. Uh, and um, he said that he was very involved back in the day with uh, SRI and he went in as a military consultant. He was 16 years old. He was trained at Letterman Hospital uh, and tested and found to be uh, have very high psychic abilities and that he, he went into SRI and this is, if you don't know, it's the uh, Stanford Research Institute, and this is where Ingo Swan and Hal Pudoff and uh, Russell Targ and others worked on the protocols for what is now known as coordinate remote viewing, and uh, also other probably above top secret matters. Uh, so they they were cons you know um, so he went in as what he called was an army operational commission. He said the Army gave him at, at the age of 16 where he wasn't legally supposed to be enlisted. Uh, this operational commission sounds quite a bit like something that happened to William Tompkins, actually. And in this case, Mark said he thinks they wanted to keep control of him. And so they gave him this commission. He went in, he consulted with uh, Pudoff and others, I guess, and uh, his reading of that was that they were quite naive and that they lacked uh, some real awareness about what was really going on at that time. Uh, he said that Letterman Hospital was heavily involved in mind control uh, and M MK Ultra research, uh, part of what is called Project Magic, uh, which I think is in the public domain at this time that much. He said that Letterman Hospital had to be destroyed. He said they they basically blew the place up because it had so much residual effects of the SciTech experiments that had been conducted in that in that place. So um, that's very interesting and I would imagine perhaps Douglas Dietrich might have something to add to that. I want to say that the best uh, history of remote viewing that I've come across and I am reading or actually have read now uh, Annie Jacobson's book Phenomena I also investigated remote viewing and I've studied it myself and done it. Um, but I can tell you that the history uh, that was written by Ingo Swan is quite compelling and um, I highly recommend it. Ingo Swan, of course, has passed on, but his website is still kept up. Uh, now the original site is, is not there and what is now in place of it is, uh, I guess, being kept up by someone uh, associated with Ingo Swan or his family. The original website used to be called biomindsuperpowers.com, I believe, and um, if you want to look for the original website, it is probably available in what we call the Wayback Machine, uh, but Ingo's current site may also have this very good history of remote viewing. I haven't had a chance to check in depth on that site, but I, I recommend that you do look for this information if you're interested in getting more information about the history of remote viewing. 
we also talked about the fascist beings, uh, the race of from Aldebaran, who are also related in a, in essence, a television show called The Event. I have mentioned it more than once in the past. And this uh, television show can be seen on Netflix. I believe it's still available there, uh, as well as other places. It's a, what you call it, I think more or less a mini series. Uh, and it was basically telling the story of what is, it appears is a true story. I've had now several corroborations, other witnesses besides Mark Richards, uh, who are saying that the beings from Aldebaran have destroyed at least one of their planets, have come back to Earth after um, many years back in the time when they were helping the Nazis uh, and, you know, helped the Nazis with the secret space program back in World War II. They are now back and they have been given some land in Africa, is what I was told. And they are also able to eat our food and breathe our air. They look humanoid. As to whether they actually are humanoid, I don't know. Uh, I've gotten mixed information on that score. But he says uh, that they are an, an, one of the sort of invading races, if you want to call it that, but they are not a big problem at this time in his, in his view. That uh, the Trogs from Angkor Wat, the time of Angkor Wat, are uh, returning and they are much more of a concern to the secret space program at this time. And uh, interestingly, I have another whistleblower who had told me about an impending invasion of some spider beings uh, actually quite a while ago. A person asked me to ask Mark Richards about the Orion spacecraft that are parked in orbit around the Earth and are part of our fleet. And um, Mark said, in answer to the question, the question was, how do we get you know, do those craft land on Earth or do they have to, you know, take a craft up to the to the Orion ships? And, and Mark said that they do not land on Earth and that any craft that they take can even be a rocket, a conventionally, mo you know, um, propelled rocket and or small craft. Uh, what I extrapolate from this is the gets back to what we call the Venture Star and that was revealed in part not only on the internet, it's, it's been out there for a while, but also by Gordon Novell in some photographs that he showed as part of my Shadow Operations uh, pilot for True TV that back in the day when Bill Ryan and I were working together, we did a pilot for True TV. Many people will know about it. It's called Shadow Operations, and you can watch it on my YouTube channel. Uh, just put in the word Shadow Op, and you should be able to pull it up. Uh, highly recommended and there's quite a story that's associated with that and how the CIA basically uh, shut down that that pilot going to series our producer and the director were fired and replaced uh, when they didn't accept the CIA offer for them to uh, be in charge of the show and I witnessed that phone call and also was um, sort of the go-between in connecting the CIA through Gordon Novell uh, to our producer at that time. Then we talked briefly about the raptors. Uh, the raptors are a race of reptilians who went off planet uh, around the time of the dinosaurs. And uh, they, cr they have a, I guess, a, a planet that is in the Draco galaxy they come and go to earth from to and from earth they consider earth one of their homes and they have been our enemies in the past but in the last uh five five years or or more actually uh have become friendly and are working with what is in essence our um air force and mark has been in touch with the raptor beings uh, since he was a child and all of this is told in my other five interviews with Mark, so I won't go into all of that. But we did briefly revisit it. Uh, he wanted to say that the Raptors are currently financing more movies and uh, that um, there are some more movies coming out. These are considered to be PR 
efforts on behalf of the raptors to try to change their relationship with humanity. Uh, he said the raptors are also now showing up in what's called the T-Rex show. Uh, I guess it's a, a, a show that's being performed in um, various locations on the planet here, I guess specifically in California and possibly the rest of the U.S. And he said that raptors are showing up there and that children are, are able to pet them and to interact with them safely. So if you want to try to go to a, a T-Rex show, perhaps you'll end up uh, being able to pet a raptor if this is accurate information. As part of this meeting with Mark this time, as I say, it was cut short. I'm not sure if it was the topics we were discussing or whether this was a prison mo motivated um, reshuffling where they decided to cut short the time. So I only had about two hours with him this in this visit. However, we did get in depth in several of these topics. We discussed uh, actually the philosophy from the military point of view that Mark seems to share uh, and admits sharing that has to do with whether or not humans can handle the truth. And although he is a whistleblower, he's revealing information that he is uh, basically being allowed to reveal in part because of the huge uh, what is called plausible deniability surrounding his case, the fact that he is in prison having supposedly masterminded a murder is supposed to keep him in in a state of being discredited to the point where they can actually release information through him as it happens to me and to his wife Joanne that gets out then to the public um, but is not probably going to be taken seriously by most people because again uh, of his his status so this is a kind of vehicle that they do use and um, in, in a certain sense, Tompkins is used in a similar similar way. In the t case of Tompkins saying that he's an older man, that he is uh, perhaps deluded or, uh, you know, that his, his information is so far out that no one would believe it, having to do with most of the secret space program assistance on the positive side comes through Nordic women, beautiful women who are acting as secretaries in the uh, in the aerospace industry, which is uh, sort of the crux of a lot of his data that he has. But um, in my view, this is, is entirely believable. So uh, we talked about this notion that humans cannot handle the truth. He said from the military point of view, there's been plenty of incidents where humans have basically kind of gone crazy or lost their mind or whatever when there was an announcement of some kind and rioted etc and uh, I talked about my philosophy that humans can handle the truth and uh, so we kind of went back and forth on that subject quite a bit um, and that was uh, quite an interesting discussion we also talked about David Adair and his disclosures regarding the alien, artificially intelligent, uh, what is in essence a being, a craft that is is an awake and aware uh, craft. And uh, David has talked at length about it. Now he's gone into the public and is talking uh, quite a bit lately. I interviewed him for three hours and you're encouraged to watch my interview with him. It's a live interview uh, via YouTube in which he talks about his whole experience with uh, his, his the craft and what he did in, to destroy his own fusion engine craft right after meeting with this uh, sort of alien craft in Area 51. And this is back when he was 17 years old. Uh, Mark says that David's description of the, tra the craft sounds remarkably like Minerva, uh, that that is a, an artificially intelligent, fully aware being that is a craft that Mark was one of the few people who was, who was capable of uh, being the pilot of during the time when he was operational in the secret space program. So uh, 
when I told Mark about the uh, what what in essence appears to be a selfless act of destroying his own craft um, after meeting with this alien craft, Mark saw it a different way. He said he would take the military point of view that in essence uh, that David might have been misled by this craft, uh, this artificial intelligence, into basically destroying his own craft to delay the secret space program and the humans for from getting into space and making progress so that he didn't necessarily see it as a selfless act in the same way. So that's a completely different take on what David did what may have happened there in that incident and uh, I think it would be very interesting to share that with David so I will in the near future. I am planning to have David Adair back on my show to talk more about his situation and his his history uh, with regard to not only the craft but other aspects of his story. Then another thing I ran by Mark, and this was more of a discussion again, and had to do with uh, what I feel is a picture, a sort of a, a story being painted by the powers that be, by the, uh, in essence, the secret space program. What is being put out for the public at this time, a heavy emphasis on uh, the reptilian Nazi connection in various whistleblowers that have come forward over the few years and especially lately of course through William Tompkins as well as others and uh, the work of uh, Joseph Farrell for example as well uh, and, and basically talking about what is in essence a scenario being painted of a potential invasion of a negative race um, and also revealing some of the power structures of what's really going on in uh, the top of the triangle, so to speak, here on planet Earth. And um, so we talked about that, and Mark agreed that my assessment was probably very accurate. Uh, we talked about what is, in essence, a sort of setup. It's, it's if you will, a kind of a Project Blue Beam view of things but it, it's it's actually an accurate one that has to do with not a fake alien invasion but a real one and one that has actually happened multiple times throughout our history and you can also look at the work of Ashiana Dean for more about this but that it is also something going on now and in the near future that humans may become aware of and uh, that that it may be sold in part by one side of the spe secret space program that's interested in in putting out something which is in essence a fake alien invasion and the other side wanting to put out what is in essence a real alien invasion. So in a certain sense they have a kind of a they're at a draw or a, a stalemate because in essence there are two sides to the secret space program one side that believes that there is uh, in essence a, a number of races out there, um, countless really, that we are dealing with uh, a number of positive races and certainly some specific negatively oriented races and that uh, this secret space program is working to protect the earth, that earth sovereignty and in essence earth defense, defending sacred ground and humanity's sovereignty as well in the face of these invasions is vitally important that humans do need to be woken up and brought in to learn the truth um, and so on. And this also has in part as an objective, even as stated by William Tompkins, the notion that humans can assist with defending the earth if they know more about it and that they won't necessarily lose their minds if they are read in slowly but surely, which does appear to be something of what's happening in terms of, of course, the, the movies and the television and disclosures like what you're getting here on Project Camelot 
and many others who are contributing to this effort. The other side of that has to do with also the Illuminati and the secret space program, the side that wants to deceive humanity, that is working on the side of the negative forces out there. And they are often trying to sell humanity on the idea that there are nothing but positive races, that humanity can just relax and go back to sleep in essence, that there's nothing to worry about, and that if you find that you're listening to someone out there, whether it's a movie, a television show, or an individual trying to sell you on the fact that there are all positive ETs out there and that you don't need to worry and that you're protected, etc., that they are very likely disarming you as part of a, a planned invasion scenario in which what is in essence the human corroborators uh, are basically uh, interested in joining the conquerors and believe they will get special treatment uh, should this come to pass. What is in essence the New World Order scenario? And uh, so it's important if you want to understand whether someone is positively or negatively oriented to sort of see what they're trying to sell you in this regard. We very briefly talked about the flat earth theory and Mark said that he thinks that it is basically a psyop to confuse people. So um, that's the end of this presentation and I do have written notes that will be put on my website that you can go back over various things and see uh, what this covers and um, thanks for watching and use your own discernment. My mission in Camelot as an investigative journalist and documentary filmmaker is to give you testimony, to bring the testimony forward of individuals that I feel have nuggets of truth and that are talking about elements of truth that it's important that humanity become aware of. It does not mean, however, that I believe everything I am told by my various witnesses. Uh, I am an investigator and I continue to keep an open mind. And I do think that that is of paramount importance when dealing with everything on planet Earth, that nothing is as simple as it may appear. And I, um, I do believe that conspiracies are common. Conspiracies of one or more persons getting together to deceive or to do a nefarious act or a diabolical act against another section of humanity. This is happening every day all over the planet. So it's, it's all about uh, how you look at things and it's very important to stay open and to stay discerning. So thanks for watching and take care. Good night.